Good evening, uh, Burlingtonians and uh, Chittenden County viewers of, uh, of our program. This is the uh, Housing Fair, Safe and Affordable. Uh, it's, a, it's a show that uh, three statewide housing programs of the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity uh, do, and one of them uh, is my program, Fair Housing Project. Uh, we also have in that in that uh, category uh, Vermont tenants providing advice, information, referral, and advocacy for tenants, and mobile home program, which does likewise for people primarily in mobile home parks. And um, tonight I have here with me uh, a guest uh, who was who was good enough to. Uh, take a little time out of the evening and and be with us. Uh, his name is Richard Watts. And um, because you folks at, at UVM sometimes have so many overlapping and twisting kind of titles and, and functions, I'll let you explain that. Okay. Well, thank you, Ted, and great to be here. Um, so... Uh, mostly we're going to talk about transportation and for a number of years I worked at something at UVM called the Transportation Research Center which looks at how we can make our transportation system work for people and also reduce its environmental and energy impacts. Uh, right now I teach in communications and I teach in policy and I teach in media and I direct at something else called the Center for Research on Vermont which is about understanding some of the great things we do in Vermont and how they re relate to larger things happening in the world. So yes, you're right. We have way too many complicated, <laughs> oh, whatever. But basically I teach, I think about policy and I think about Vermont. Right. So uh, as uh, was mentioned, the transportation is kind of the main focus. And of course, being the fair housing project person, uh, I like to keep tying it around to uh, the role that transportation plays uh, overall in creating more affordable and uh, and more inclusive communities that people of uh, varying incomes and people of varying backgrounds can afford to live in locations that are uh, that are more affordable to them that are that have better access. Uh, to uh, resources of, uh, of municipalities, of uh, uh, things, the services, the, the jobs, and all that comes along with that, and also the inherent efficiency that provides in terms of both reducing costs to the people living there as well as uh, the positive impacts on the environment, obviously. So I guess uh, let me just start with a question uh, for you. Uh, how expensive is transportation as a part of, uh, you know, the common uh, budgets of people? And I am, of course, particularly interested in uh, percentage of uh, income that lower people would have, that lower income people would have to pay. Right. So... One thing, one way to think about this is when we say transportation, people often in their heads will do a, so if I, if, you, if I ask you how much did it cost you to go to Boston, people often do a calculation of how much it costs in terms of gasoline. And we don't always think about the sunken costs of owning a car, if we own a car, and what uh, all the money that goes into maintenance and all those things. So. There's a long way of saying that on average, owning a car can cost somewhere between six and $12,000 a year. When you take in the cost of the vehicle and the cost of the energy to run the vehicle, it can be as much as 30% of somebody's income. And as your income goes down, those fixed costs still exist, so it becomes a higher percent of your income. So people of very low income may pay as much as 50% of their total household costs goes to maintaining the transportation, goes to allowing them to access, you know, uh, a system 
that they can get places. And we know uh, in in my the bigger agency that my program is a part of, CVOEO, there's many programs uh, primarily for lower income people and uh, trying to help people in various kinds of crisis situations and so forth. And the whole uh, car factor and the dependency on cars is, is, is really um, pretty dramatic in terms of the impact. Right. Uh, if, somebody's car, if somebody's car breaks down, they can't afford to have it fixed. If it, you know, they get involved in an accident, can't afford to get it back on the road. Uh, you know, in addition to what's already been mentioned, the just upkeep, the insurance, you know, the, all the things that go along with maintaining a car. And that's especially bad the further those people have to live away from where they need to go to work, to go to the doctor, to go uh, shopping and all those necessary daily things, uh, it, it can create a huge uh, isolation factor, yeah. So, and we know a bit about this in Vermont because the, there's a, a organization here, VEIC, that just did a study where they looked at how much your transportation costs depending on where you live. And, and it makes sense that people sometimes move further and further away from where they work because those houses are cheaper. And yet, at the same time, the further away they are, then the more expensive it is to get to work. And so when you look at this map that this VEIC put together, it's just stunning. And you can imagine it, the further you are out from Burlington in those sort of commuter sheds, the more expensive it is your transportation might be. And if your income is low, that's a higher proportion of your budget. And I think that part of what we've done over time is we've become trapped in a, such a car-dependent society that there isn't really any options for getting around for some people. And we really need to think about ways to allow people to have other options besides just driving places. Yeah. I know that um, I was involved in a study a couple of years ago uh, in the northwest quadrant of the state, and we ultimately um, uh, kind of drill down to the town of Georgia to focus on and, and talking to their planning commission some of the facts about transportation and housing location issues. This interesting uh, dynamic came out that they have, they have not, it's, it's, it's a pretty small town, so there's not a huge amount of uh, a number of jobs there, but there are, uh, there is some small industry and people working there uh, are having to live north of Georgia where it is cheaper to, to uh, afford the housing and then they commute down to Georgia. Then you have people living in Georgia who work in Chittenden County, some in Burlington, who uh, can't afford to live in this area and live in Georgia. So you have this very interesting transportation yes. dynamic. Yes. No, I think that um, uh, it's just we've got 90 years of building the system that we have. We really have to start thinking about ways to allow people to have other options, and we're trapped. And we spend so much money supporting the existing system that, um, that if we could rethink it, we could give people more alternatives, cheaper alternatives, alternatives that would add to the quality of living. Well, you know, one of the things I, uh, because a large part of what uh, my fair housing project does is has less to do with individual cases of discrimination, although we're concerned about that also, but it has to do more with systemic issues, with the kind of uh, ways that zoning bylaws, that uh, permitting processes, and all of those things that uh, tend to make it more expensive uh, to build housing, especially uh, less expensive multifamily housing closer to downtowns. And uh, <coughs> so it seems like it, it, when I talk about um, 
transportation issues, a lot, a lot of times people, especially further out in the state in, the, in a smaller town, <coughs> say, well, we're never going to be able to afford public transportation. And in, in, in some cases, maybe they actually could someday, but aside from that, given that they cannot, they, they most likely will not, at least in the near future, then you don't look at just the transportation, but you look at where housing is there for people. And are there ways that you can in, induce or at least uh, eliminate barriers that keep people from producing more housing closer to where people need to go? Yes. No, and sometimes we talk about this in transportation terms, mobility, the ability to go anytime, anywhere you want, and access, the ability to access the things you need. And if you reframe it a bit as access, then you start talking about where you live, you know, because then you can access the things you need without having to have a car, because in this society, the way the system is built, the only way you can have complete mobility is be car dependent. Yeah. But if you think about it in terms of what do you need, then you might think about in terms of where you live. And the other message that we're talking about here is that it's, it is more expensive than people realize to live further away. Yeah. And, and you make that choice because housing is cheaper, but at the same time, you have these other costs that aren't always factored in. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so the, it's the complicated individual uh, math that you look at, well, where can I actually afford to pay my rent? Right. And keep up and not get, you know, evicted. Uh, and so naturally that's kind of the first consideration. Uh, if you're seeking housing, where, where can I afford to live in terms of the actual cost of the housing? But then, as you say, there are other costs that uh, that kind of counterbalance that. Uh, but the, the people caught in that can't help it because if they were in more expensive housing, then they would possibly be out on the street right. with no housing. Right. 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 Uh, so it's it's it, what it ultimately does is tends to drive their standard of living, their right. ability to get out of, you know, any kind of state of poverty or low, right. lower income. Right. It just keeps spiraling right. down. Well, you've thought about this a lot, Ted, but I'll give you one idea and see what you think of this. So, okay, transit, we talk about public transit, and then we say we can't afford it, and it's too, you know, but um, part of the problem with public transit is that most people, many of us don't ride it because we have cars and we can afford our cars and parking is free or almost free. So why wouldn't you drive your car? You already have all the costs associated with owning the car. So my suggestion in those, along those lines is that we need to think more about making it more expensive to park. We do that at UVM, although we haven't changed the rates in 10 years. So people do pay to park and then bus is free. So that incentivizes everybody to ride the bus. And the more people that ride the bus, then the more constituencies there are demanding more bus service, and then the more potential bus routes are, there are, and then there's, it makes it a better option for more people. Right. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask, and, and this is kind of leading, you know, some of the stuff we've already talked about leads into this, but. Uh, how do we build places that allow people to walk, bike, and drive less, that allow people to ride buses and, and walk and bike, right. for instance? Right. Well, I think we need champions. We need leaders. We need uh, policies, public policy, at the government level and at the company level. So there's a lot of companies that could you just instantly, overnight, start trying to incentivize their employees to drive a little less, start charging a little for parking, make the bus really cheap. And as those people start riding the bus, then they ask for more routes and it becomes a positive feedback loop. And as far as building places that are great, Burlington, there are many great places in Vermont. One of the interesting things about Vermont is we have 235 village centers and they haven't been destroyed, although many of them are challenged. But we still have these small walkable places. If we could just invest more in our sidewalks and in 
and in helping people figure out ways to make those attractive places to live. In a way, we have these little dense pockets that then could be connected via transit systems. Well, I know that uh, in, in terms of the work I do uh, is often <clears throat> focused on uh, trying to work with uh, municipalities on ways that they can uh, create more affordable housing opportunities. And, you know, in the context of our discussion, I would say more affordable housing and more affordable situations, uh, locations as well uh, in terms of the, the transportation aspect. Yes. But what, one of, some of the things we run into are uh, some of the, what in, in most cases is an antiquated uh, system of zoning bylaws. Um, they require a couple of parking spots per That require yeah. a lot of parking and that require huge acreage per unit of housing. Right. And that require huge setbacks right. <clears throat> from streets, right. and that uh, even though it begins to <clears throat> fly in the face of some of the state law, right. they often uh, will, to the to the best of their ability, exclude multifamily housing. Ah. Sometimes uh, senior housing is considered okay, but even right. that is often right. not looked on positively. So this is a matter of uh, getting people, you know, because people will only change, I think, with several factors. <clears throat> One, of course, some people just recognize, well, this is not good for other people. It's not, you know, we may have our nice home here in the town center, but this is not good for all those other people. But then also there are people who on businesses, maybe want to expand businesses, maybe want to increase the number of people consuming their, you know, buying and consuming their whatever goods and services they're selling. So what we're trying to do is really convince uh, uh, people, and there's a lot of uh, information backing this up, that generating more affordable housing closer to downtowns increases the economic vitality of the town. So it's not just a, you know, a thing you do for other people, it's a thing you do for the good of your own town. Right. Uh, you know, your own self-interest. Right. <clears throat> That's a great vision. <laughs> so, you know, in that context, obviously, uh, creating uh, zoning that, rec that enables more density right. also creates more opportunity for public transportation. Exactly. <clears throat> because if you don't have people scattered all over right. creation, you know, it makes it more affordable to provide the transit people can access. Uh, yeah, no, there's a direct relationship, and um, many people have studied that. A certain density is helpful. One stop, because you, you don't want multi-stops on a bus because it slows it down. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> In so, fact, James Howard Kunstler, who wrote this book, The End of No, uh, whatever it is, it, he says you couldn't build one of our villages today under present zoning. I know. Yes, absolutely. I, I've seen uh, some good uh, presentations uh, that looks at uh, some of the the more s significantly sized uh, towns in the state now and goes back to sometimes in the 19th century when they were much more densely populated than they are now. So people, you know, tend to get this mindset that, oh, this is, we just want it like this the way it's always been, you know, but well, no, not necessarily the way it's always been, you know. And, and those towns have been, you know, had their dynamism and some of them have lost their dynamism partly because of the fading population and the yeah. density close to you know, where their businesses and, uh, you know, services are. Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> so I understand that you have, the, and this is a, a curiosity to me. I mean, I, I have some ideas, but you have concerns about electric cars that are often uh, being promoted as the answer to uh, states' energy environmental impacts. Right. And 
I'm curious uh, what your concerns are. Right. And if you can talk some about that. Sure, and ironically, I used to run an electric car project, but um, so I have two, two concerns. I do think that electric cars are part of the solution to reducing this, the energy and environmental impacts of transportation. But what happens too often is that we lead with electric cars as the only solution, and that's because it's easier for policymakers because they're basically saying you don't have to do anything different. We're simply going to switch the fuel in the vehicle you drive. And what it does ultimately, so that's, it's easy for policymakers to say we're going to electrify everything, but what it does ultimately is it takes those folks and the first adopters of electric cars are going to be the most impassioned about change. It takes that entire constituency out of doing alternatives. Because once you have a car, every study shows you're going to drive it. That's, that's why you have it. And you can't really encourage people not to use their cars. You can't really promote public transit. You can't really promote biking or walking if everybody is driving. And so you can, we can argue about the environmental benefits of, of electric cars from all the way from building them to the processing the plastic and mining the rare minerals you need for the batteries. But just putting that argument aside, what I am concerned about is that by saying electric car, electric car is the solution, it's undercutting these other solutions that we really need to do. And it leaves out people who can't afford to own a car, people who don't drive for whatever reason, those who are too young to drive, those who are too old. And we know now in this state that you outlive your ability to drive probably by seven to 10 years. So there's whole constituencies of people that aren't gonna be able to fit into a car only world. And we need to start with the alternatives work on those like crazy and then say, and we can also do this. Yeah. That's my argument, Ted. Yeah, <laughs> and you're sticking to it. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, some of my environmentalist friends say, yeah, but you can't do it, Richard, it's a rural state, you know, we're all gonna drive and yes, there's always gonna be driving, but why can't we at least try and start bending it a little bit to make the actual options more yeah. viable? Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's, <clears throat> important to anytime you have a <clears throat> a kind of a movement to replace one thing with another thing but yet still have basically the same kind of systems uh, you know the same roads they run on the same distances between locations then you have an added factor with electric cars of uh, especially lower income people are not going to be able to afford them, at least for a long time. Right. And so they're still stuck and maybe even worse stuck if it becomes harder to get, you know, right. the only kind of uh, internal combustion car they can get or the kind of the dregs that are the, what they already get, unfortunately, right. uh, that are break down easily and cost, use a lot of gas. And, and imagine if all those electric car drivers were riding on the bus and they were like, we need every 15 minutes. This bus, the Wi-Fi has to work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this bus shelter is freezing. Yeah, yeah. Get, get some, uh, you know, heat panels up yeah. there. Right? Yeah. Right. All right. So uh, we've already touched on a lot of this, but uh, I have a, uh, a question here. What are some of the consequences of our car dependence? And I don't know if you can right. name any more than we've already well, we, touched on. So often we think about energy. So in Vermont right now, about 40%, 30 to 40% of all the energy we use is used in transportation. And because it's almost all purchasing gasoline, almost all of that leaves the state. And it's been identified as about a one and a half billion dollar leaky bucket. So we are spending, Vermonters collectively, almost one and a half billion dollars, all of which is exported out of the state. Okay, so there's an economic issue there. We haven't, and then there's the environmental impact. So again, transportation is leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont. There's also other things associated with what comes out of the tailpipe, okay. But in addition to those, there's all these social factors that we have identified related to our car dependence. So for example, 
as a country, we're getting heavier and heavier. There's a direct relationship between the fact that we drive more and more every year. Robert Putnam, the sociologist, did this political scientist, did this fabulous work about relationship between your community and how much you spend driving. And he found, statistically, that every 10 minutes you spend driving, commuting away from your community, you're 10% less likely to be engaged in your local community. And so there's, yeah. there's a direct sort of relationship between all that time we spend in our cars, which is a week to two weeks a year, and how much we, time we have to participate locally. Yeah. Yeah, when I when I think of uh, the kind of commutes, you know, when you, especially when you get outside of Vermont into you know some of the big metropolitan right. areas and the kind of commutes that people do and the time they spend commuting, right. uh, I, you know, it just boggles the mind, really. You know that they can even. Right. you know, managed to live that way. <laughs> but, you know, what's happened is that the, the car is this really robust thing. It's attractive. It's comfortable. The radio works. You go in this bubble. Some of the smartest minds are designing ads to hook us on this culture. Uh, and so it's, it's, and we spend so much money supporting it. You know, 90% of the state's transportation budget supports this system. So changing that is going to be really difficult. But I think that there's a whole lot of people who are left out of the system, and that's part of uh, why we need to change it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, all of this is, uh, is really, like, I, I really like to have a you know, holistic view and analysis of uh, the intersections between Things like housing, housing location, housing cost, right. transportation costs, and and clearly there's a, a very distinct link between where people live and uh, how much time they're going to be driving if they have to drive at all. And right. in some cases, in the right locations, they might hardly ever have to drive if at all. Right. Uh, but what we have in in Vermont, almost uh, in, uh, in different from uh, you know big metropolitan areas, you tend to have concentrations of very low income people in in abandoned downtown, abandoned by white people and people with money. Although there tends to be some reversing of that, which has its own problems with yes. it. Yes, yeah. Uh, sure. yeah. But those people have to, uh, you know, in order to get to what to what they, in order to get to what they need to do, you know, because there's virtually no fresh food. There's, you know, uh, so few opportunities in so many ways. There, they have to travel, and generally, they do not, cannot, possibly have their own cars right. for the most part. Right. So they have to, you know, use overburdened and not well-maintained uh, public transportation right. to get out. Right. Then you have uh, people that more tend to be more white and more uh, higher income, you know, traveling into the suburban areas uh, and, and sometimes <laughs> some downtown areas. And so this whole kind of segregation thing, that's both racial and socioeconomic, uh, feeds the transportation issue. It very does. Much. It does. And often these big infrastructure projects are located in poor neighborhoods. Yes. Always. Oh, exactly. Uh, I mean that goes all the way back to you know the, the late fifties, early sixties. Does indeed. Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've ha had the signal that we're approaching the end of the show, and I just want to say that uh, I think uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. I certainly appreciate your willingness to come on and share your knowledge and expertise with us, and uh, I, I hope that uh, people who uh, are viewing this may uh, come away with, you know, some thoughts and uh, 
you know, you can get in touch with us, uh, you know, if you have questions you want to run by or suggestions or whatever. For sure. Um, so. Well, it's been my pleasure, Ted, and it's good for me to get reminded of all the housing issues and how well they connect with transportation. Yeah, yeah, they, they really do. Thank you very much again. Thanks.